Okay, so good morning everybody and welcome to this tutorial where the focus is on <clears throat> the role of visualization in, in decision making. Problems that have multiple conflicting objectives. <clears throat> and uh, my name is Jussi Hakanen for those of you who are not, who don't know me yet, I'm a senior researcher at, at the IT faculty. And uh, the outline of my talk is, is the following. So um, I start with some motivation of why, why visualization is important in this context, and then how it is, how it can be used in decision making. Then we have a look at some individual visualization techniques and how what are the pros and cons and how they can be used in many objective optimization. And then we also have a look at some available tools for visualization. And we conclude by uh, having a look at some future research challenges in this topic. Okay. So let's start by, by asking why why visualization is important in, in this context and not, not, not in general, because that, let's, let's not have that, that wide of perspective. Um, but what, 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 is, uh, what have, has been uh, noticed is that the real world decision problems typically have multiple conflicting objectives for evaluating the candidate decisions to be made. And uh, in the title of the talk, you, you saw this term many objective. And here it means that there are more than three objectives to be optimized simultaneously. And why more than three? Um, from the visualization perspective, the situation gets uh, more challenging when you have more than three objectives. But the tools and ideas can also be applied to problems with two or three objectives but I just wanted to highlight that where, where the challenges are coming from. And uh, the candidate solutions for the final decision are, are parallel optimal solutions, which means that no objective can be improved without impairing some other one. And I think in Kaiser's tutorial, uh, multi-objective optimization and different approaches of solving multi-objective optimization problems were discussed in more details, so I'm not going to go into, into those details in this talk, uh, while I'm concentrating only on the visualization aspects. But the important thing here is that <clears throat> without any additional imp uh, information, uh, parallel optimal solutions cannot be ordered, so, so there's a need for some human decision maker who is an expert in the application area considered who can provide preference information and compare different Pareto optimal solutions. <clears throat> and for problems having uh, more than three objectives, visualization is, is an extremely important tool in analyzing the properties of the candidate solutions in order to be able to make informed decisions. My talk today, or this presentation, is mostly based on uh, book chapter that me and Kaisa and two of our colleagues at, at Cornell University recently wrote on, on a, a book titled Many Criteria Optimization and Decision Analysis that is to appear, appear this or next year. Let's see how it goes. The thing I would like to start with is to give you some, some framing here. Uh, <clears throat> as, I, as the topic, uh, the title said, uh, visualization is considered in decision support. And in this case, <clears throat> we are uh, thinking about constructive decision making, which means that the problem has to be constructed and solved at the same time. <clears throat> so meaning that there is no uh, fixed problem formulation to start with, but the problem formulation is evolving during the 
solution process. And uh, <clears throat> when when problem formulation is, is concerned, uh, usually uh, problem structuring methods are uh, applied which means that you have to define different elements of a decision problem. For example, values that are important in that decision context. And then from the values, you can derive objectives, constraints, and then finally decision variables and so on. And an example of a problem structuring is a value-focused thinking by Professor Ralph Keeney. So if you're interested in, in, in that kind of approach where you start from the values, so thinking about what matters or what is important for you in this decision, and then try to identify what could be the objectives that could measure those values. So if you're interested, you can find more details in the, for example, in the paper cited below. <clears throat> Another uh, important element here is that many real world decision problems have multiple stakeholders, meaning that there, uh, there are multiple decision makers instead of a single one. And that can, that can present different challenges also from the visualization perspective. Because when you have multiple decision makers involved, there might not be an obvious agreement of the problem formulation or what should be the most preferred final decision. Um, here you can see an illustration of a constructive decision making process where four different phases are identified. So starting with the first one, uh, you, you have the problem formulation phase, which we already discussed uh, earlier. Then the second one is called guided optimization, where you were given problem formulation is, is solved by using optimization technique, techniques that, that include preferences of decision makers. And then the third phase is trade of assessment where you analyze the solutions uh, uh, obtained from the previous phase uh, from the perspective of mathematical optimality, uncertainty, robustness or sensitivity or other other important uh, properties. And then the final phase is the solution selection where you actually select the uh, most preferred solution. And uh, in, in case of multiple decision makers, there, there is this conflict resolution aspect and then also uh, mapping actions to consequences. So, so Meaning that if, 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 we, if we select this solution, what it actually means in, in practice. And this is not a linear process, but, but it, it is a kind of uh, cyclic approach. So once you have solved the, uh, solved the problem, assessed the solutions and selected the final solution, you might realize that the problem formulation was not, was not perfect. So you need to go back to the problem formulation and then again start going through different phases. But uh, the observation here is that visualization can actually be utilized in all the phases. And another observation is that uh, all decision making processes do not necessarily include all these phases, depending on, for example, the number of decision makers types of optimization approaches used or the actual decision context. So, so in practice, uh, the process could include some or all of these phases. But this is the context that we, we kind of look at the visualization and, and how, how visualization can support this, this process. Okay, so let's let's move on and see how how visualization can be used in decision making. So what what we could visualize um, in this presentation, we consider visualizations in these different phases of the uh, constructive decision making process that we just saw. 
for example, how to support problem structuring, uh, how to visualize individual solutions or solution sets, uh, visualizing both the objective and the decision space, although most of the visualizations are co uh, concentrated on visualizing the objective space, which, which uh, represents the performance of the different solutions. But the decision space is also equally important since it tells you how the, uh, how the different solutions are implemented in practice. But the thing is that, that many of the decision space visualizations are application specific, so there are no, uh, no general uh, guidelines for doing that. Uh, then visualizations can also be used for supporting the decision maker in, in specifying uh, preferences or analyzing the, the preferences that the decision maker has specified in, in, in the past. In addition to these, these things, visualization can also be utilized in many objective optimization. For example, in analyzing the performance of optimization algorithms or setting par parameters for those, uh, understanding topological characteristics of the decision space. But these things are not considered in this presentation, but there are some, some references to papers dealing with, with those aspects if you are interested. These are, these are mostly, uh, mostly useful for the method developers of uh, uh, multi-objective optimization methods. Let's start by uh, having a look at some, some terminology from visualization. A key research field here is called visual analytics, which, which has sometimes been described as the science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interfaces. So what, what visual analytics basically does is that it, it com combines these visual, visualization aspects and uh, the kind of uh, data analysis or, or problem solving aspects and then uh, merges them into a sing single uh, process, which, uh, which is very close to what, to what uh, uh, we are doing in, in the constructive decision making. Then an uh, important concept is also an interactive visual interface mentioned in the the description above. It just means that the user can interact with the interface and change its appearance and how data is shown there. So it's kind of responsive. So if the decision maker or the user does something there, it, it reflects the, the, the changes. And I guess the opposite is a static visualization where you just have a static uh, image of something, but you cannot do anything with that. Brushing is also an important concept, which means that the user can interactively select a subset of data points. Because if you have a, a large number of data points to be visualized, it sometimes doesn't make sense to visualize all them at the same time, but you can kind of interactively select some subsets of those points to be visualized. Then linking means that uh, you can have different, uh, different uh, views or different uh, visualiz visualizations of the same data, but they are linked together so that if you interact with one of the visualizations, you see the corresponding uh, uh, effects also in the other, other views. And to sum up this uh, coordinated multiple views, uh, it's a set of views that enable interactive exploration of the data for a decision maker. And the coordinated multiple views um, context is, is very, very important in this, this presentation. Okay, so we can, we can uh, continue on, uh, and, and just, just remembering what, what is different. Terms. 
by the way, if, if any of you have any questions, uh, you can interrupt me uh, whenever you have the questions. Here I just listed some surveys of how visualization has been used in multi-objective decision making or multi-objective optimization before. So I don't go into any details, but if you are interested, this is a list where you can find more information. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have some some kind of context context where, where we are doing, where we are considering visualization. And the next, uh, I will show you some of the individual visualization techniques for high dimensional data that have been used in, in many objective optimizations. <clears throat> so most common way of using visualizations in this context has been to show the performance of, of individual solutions or solution sets in the objective space. And uh, you can roughly divide these approaches into two categories. First, visualizing individual solutions as such. Or the second one is visualizing some transformations of solutions to, to highlight some properties of, of these solutions. And we will use this, this category, categorization in this presentation. And for illustration purposes, we visualize an example set of solutions that is coming from a four objective DTL set benchmark problem, DTL set seven benchmark problem. And the solution set is 216 Pareto optimal solutions that are sampled from the known Pareto front for that problem. Uh, so so the, in the benchmark problems, of course, uh, the, the good thing is that you know which solutions are Pareto optimal, so it's easy to easy to identify those. But this is just for illustration purposes. Okay, so we start from techniques for plotting individual solutions. And there are five different techniques illustrated here. So in A, we have a bubble plot, which is kind of a two-dimensional scatter plot where the size and color are used to represent other objectives. So for example, in this case, we have objective one, and objective two in the axis, and then objective three and objective four are denoted by colors of the bubbles and the size of the bubbles. <clears throat> so here you can see that there are, seem to be four different clusters in, in, in this set of paradoptimal solutions. But it, it can also depend on how you select the axis to, or the objectives to be visualized. Then uh, in B, you see a three dimensional scatter plot where you have first three objectives as, as axis, and then the fourth objective is represented by a color. And now you can see that uh, in this case, you, you observe eight kind of uh, clusters of the solutions. And then it, it, it looks a bit different than, than in A. And this is also subject to how you select the objectives to be represented. Then in C, we have a radial visualization where the objectives are on the circumference of, of the sphere here, and, and the solutions are, represent the equilibrium between different objectives. And here yeah, you can see the shape and distribution of the solutions, but, but not the quality of the solutions as such. Then in D, we have a heat map where uh, each objective is represented as a column and each solution is represented as a row. And, and the, the color denotes the, the objective value for a specific solution. And uh, heat maps can be used to illumin uh, illuminate patterns 
but not trade-offs between individual solutions as such. And then finally in E we have a parallel coordinate plot, which is useful for navigating trade-offs, but not for solution set properties as such. And uh, for radial visualization heat map and parallel coordinate plot, one can say that they are sensitive to the order of the objectives. Uh, in, in, in uh, uh, we're visualizing the different properties. So let's let's have an example of that. Um, do I have it here? This is a web-based uh, parallel coordinate plot implementation from Cornell University, and I have now downloaded the same data that we had in the previous previous uh, figures. By the way, can you see this? Yes, you see. Yes. Okay, all right, good. So this is an example of an interactive visualization. So now you now you see the, all the solutions here. But what one thing that you can do, or, or let's say that first uh, you can see that for the first three objectives, the set uh, doesn't contain values in the mid, uh, middle range of uh, no, middle, middle values of the range here. But for the fourth objective, you see that the, the, all the range is kind of populated. So this might uh, indicate that the, the Pareto front uh, for the, uh, if, uh, from the perspective of the first three objectives is disjoint, but then uh, the fourth objective is, is, seems to be quite continuous. What you can do now here is that you can change the order of the objectives. Is it just just tracking the objectives in a way? And now you can see that depending on how you arrange the objective objectives, this this uh, visualization looks different. So the order of the objectives actually matters. Okay, then we discussed about brushing. So you can select some some ranges for each objective and then it shows the solutions that, that satisfy those ranges and you can do this for different axes and then now you see that the set of solutions you are seeing is, is reduced and by doing a interactive processing you can reduce the solutions and, and for example, here you can see that, okay, for the first objectives, the solutions behave quite similarly, that, but there is a single solution that uh, has different kind of values for F2 than the others. So you can reveal this kind of uh, dependencies here. And of course you can re revert uh, or reset the process so you can see the whole set of solutions. And there are also other options. You can use dark color scheme if you want. You can change the opacity of the solutions shown. And you see that the, one of the drawbacks of parallel coordinates is that if you have a large number of solutions to be visualized, you can, you can observe cluttering and, and it's not that nice to see. Okay, but this is an example of, of uh, interactive visualization. And, uh, and uh, as we saw, there is some, uh, some um, effect or, or it matters which order you have the objectives here. Okay, let's get back to the visualization, all the presenters. Okay, so still continuing plotting for individual solutions. This visualization here is called a scatterplot matrix. <clears throat> so it, it represents all the pairwise uh, two dimensional scatter plots of the objectives. So this helps understanding the trade offs between each pair of the objectives. But of course, the, the kind of the overall uh, 
dependencies uh, between more than two objectives are not trivial here. And the diagonal shows the, the histogram of the objective function values. So you can see, observe the same thing that for first three objectives, you don't have values in the middle, but for the uh, fourth objective, you obtain all the values. Uh, <clears throat> the drawback of uh, scatter plot matrix is that it does not scale well with respect to number of objectives, because you need to have this number of objectives times number of objectives matrix here. So uh, imagine that you would have, for example, 10 objectives. So this, this uh, scatter plot matrix would not be so easy to, easy to uh, understand. Of course, you can take, take some parts of that, but, but anyway, that's one of the drawbacks there. Then the second category was uh, plotting some transformations of solutions. And we have here four different uh, methods illustrated. So in, in figure A, we have multidimensional scaling, where the idea is that you map the points to two dimensions uh, uh, so that you seek to preserve Euclidean distance between them. So what you observe is that you have no idea about the objective values of the solutions, but you only kind of see how they are located with, with respect to each other. So you can, you can see patterns here. So you can observe these eight different, uh, or eight separate uh, subsets of the solutions. Then isomapping in, in figure B, it, it operates a bit differently, but the idea is, is the same. So first it uses clustering for the points, and then it minimizes the distances between the clusters. And uh, the, the benefit of isomapping is, is that it usually better, it is better for, for nonlinear non -linear sets or identifying the nonlinearities. But here, for example, you can see that compared to the multidimensional scaling, the, uh, the individual clusters are more apparent there. Then we have two other, other uh, techniques, salmon mapping, and which, which operates similarly than multidimensional scaling. And then we have self-organizing maps. Where, where you actually use a, a neural network to identify uh, the, the different uh, or the properties of the solution sets. And here the, the darker colors, they uh, indicate the distance between the, the, the data points. And then and, and the clusters are in this, this, uh, these uh, lighter areas. But what, what you can observe here is that, that all the techniques nicely show all eight distinct parts of the Pareto front. But the drawback, of course, is that you cannot see, say anything about the kind of the quality of the solution. So uh, about the actual values of the objective functions. Okay. How can we summarize what we just, just uh, observed? There are quite many individual visualization techniques for visualizing high dimensional data. And all of them have their benefits and drawbacks and they are good for different purposes. Uh, in, the, in the paper mentioned below, uh, the authors did some empirical comparison between the different visualization techniques. And they concluded that part of the front visualization follows the no freelance theorem, as no single visualization technique was able to adequately capture all salient properties of a solution. So it means that there is no individual visualization that you can use for all the purposes, which means that uh, multiple different views are needed for obtaining adequate understanding. And an important important aspect here is that uh, when you have this multiple views, 
uh, it, it is important that you have a linking between them so that when you interact with one of those, you uh, see the effects in the others as well. Okay, so there that was about in, in individual visualization techniques. But then <clears throat> let's move on and see how we could integrate those into many objective decision support. And we do this uh, with respect to the four different phases of constructive decision making process that we saw already. and see how, how they could be used in different, different phases. And we start from problem formulation. Um, in the problem formulation phase, just, just to remind you, the idea was to identify the different uh, components of a decision problem, including relevant uncertainties if they are some. Um, quite often uh, there is a need to uh, study and evaluate different or several competing problem formulations in parallel. So of course one, one, uh, one option could be that you start from a single problem formulation, you optimize, you analyze the results and uh, select the uh, proper solutions and then, then go back to the problem formulation if needed. But if you start from uh, uh, different uh, competing formulations, you can kind of uh, uh, speed up the process a bit because you are doing uh, multiple, or you are analyzing multiple formulations at the time and it might, uh, it, it, it might give you more information to identify what is actually what is potentially wrong in the formulation and how you can how you can improve that. So it might might reduce the number of iterations that you need to do. And um, the visualization tools used for the problem formulation phase have not been studied that much if you compare it to visualizing the individual solutions. But there exists some techniques that have been used. For example, means ends objective networks, value trees, where you see an, an example in the slide, and then causal mappings. And um, I guess Yoni is going to talk more about causal, causality in the coming tutorial, so I'm not going into that anymore. But value tree zone here is kind of a tree that, that shows the structure of your problem formulation. And you can move up and down in the tree based on two different questions. In going up, you ask why this is important. And then if you want to go down in the tree, you ask how this can be uh, evaluated. And uh, in, in, in the full value tree in the top, you have the, the, the kind of the values that you have. And then on the, on the bottom of the tree, you have the means of evaluating those values or evaluating some objectives that represent uh, the values that you have. Okay, let's, let's have an example about problem formulation. Uh, there is an, an, an real world uh, decision making problem related to general aviation aircraft product family design that is studied in, in different, different papers where the idea is that you have the three different types of planes. You have two, four and six seaters and you want to, do, to design the, the family in a way that uh, for example, you, you utilize the same part, uh, partly same components in different, different planes. So you can, you can make the production more efficient. 
but there are also other kind of objectives and then for that reason there has been different formulations on, on, of this problem available uh, uh, especially formulations with one two and ten objective functions and um, in the paper by Woodruff and all and others um, they they uh, the idea was to demonstrate how visual analytics can be used to analyze these different formulations and, and how the different formulations behave with respect to each other. And uh, coordinated multiple views were used here. And uh, the results in the problem showed that, first of all, in, in, in the right hand side, you see uh, uh, one illustration from the paper where you first, in, in figure A, you have only the, the uh, objective in the uh, single objective formulation. That is an, an, an some kind of aggreg aggregation of all the objectives and then and the aggregation denotes the performance. And you can see that this, this uh, yellow or green solution in the far uh, left is the kind of the optimal solution with, with respect to that performance criteria. Then in, in figure B, you have the two objective formulation where you have the performance and then you have this other objective. I, I don't remember at the moment what it was, what it stands for. Uh, but anyway, one of the other objectives. And now you see that the, the uh, blue solutions here denote the, the Pareto optimal solutions for this problem. And then in, in uh, figure C, you have the solutions for the 10 objective formulation that are illustrated in this three-dimensional scatter plot, where, where three of the objectives are, are chosen. And, and the, the solutions are denoted by red. And now if you look at all these different uh, visualizations, you see that all of uh, solutions from all of these formulations are illustrated in each of the each of the plots. Although in this this single objective uh, solution, this yellow one, is based in, in with respect to that objective, you see that it's it's kind of uh, not that good if if you uh, think about it for in, in the uh, other formulations. And the same goes for these uh, solu blue solutions of the two objective formulation. Uh, when you uh, uh, show them in, in the, with respect to, to more than uh, two objectives. And although these, these uh, red solutions seem to be not that good in, with respect to performance objective, you see that uh, they, behave, they perform uh, better with, with the other objectives. So the results show that the, the, these, these standard single and uh, bi-objective formulations, they, they neglect important alternatives if they optimize only these two objectives. And secondly, the aggregation schemes used to, to get these uh, performance uh, measure and uh, measures they sought to be biased to only few of the objectives. And the third was that, that this broader than objective formulation uh, uh, gave significant gains uh, with respect to the other objectives. And, and, and then it could provide, uh, provide a diverse design, set of designs that could be of interest to different markets. So this, this study just shows that uh, the, the problem formulation plays an important effect. And, and if, you, if you only want to uh, aggregate your objectives uh, so that you could use uh, the tools that you have been used to applying for uh, single or, or bi-objective formulations, 
then you could lose a lot of information there. Okay, but this this is an example of how you can how you can kind of uh, use visualizations to support the kind of the analyzing of competing problem formulations. Okay. The second phase after the problem formulation was the guided optimization or the optimization, depending on how you how you do that. And uh, this phase actually involves the, the optimization that, that Kaisa was talking about in her uh, tutorial earlier. And quite often it is uh, beneficial to use preference information in this phase. It can be either a priori, a posteriori, or interactive type of approach. And depending on, on what approach you use, uh, the, the result, although the next phases could be a bit different. So in this phase, visualization could be used, for example, supporting the decision makers in specifying preferences. By, by allowing them to analyze the existing solutions and, and kind of uh, uh, showing them what kind of solutions are potentially missing or, or what kind of improvements could be available for some of the objectives. Or the other, the other thing is that you can also analyze the progress of preferences if you have this if you have an interactive approach where you kind of iteratively provide the preferences to improve the solutions. So you can also visualize how the pro preferences have evolved and, and, and use that, that also in, in getting, uh, giving more information for the decision maker about uh, his or her own preferences and how they have changed. Because that's that's the that's the the integral uh, element of interactive methods that the decision maker is allowed to learn during the solution process and adjust his or her preferences according to that new knowledge. So um, in the visualization. Uh, visualization fields, the visual designs of, of, of uh, software or interfaces, they quite often start from task abstraction, which means that uh, uh, you want to, to, to identify what kind of tasks the users face, is, users face when they are solving their problems. And then based on the tasks, you can uh, design the visualizations or visual uh, aspects based on the task at hand. Um, this, uh, in the context of uh, many objective optimization, this has not been done, done a lot so far. So kind of uh, designing the user interfaces based on the, the expertise and, 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 and advice from the visualization fields, it's, it's not that been a common practice. Uh, one example of uh, that uh, was presented in, in our paper, which was uh, recently accepted. And in the paper, we did the task abstraction for interactive multi-objective optimization. So what kind of tasks decision makers face when, when they are using interactive multi-object optimization methods. And based on the, that analysis, we identified seven different tasks, which you can see here. So comparing parent optimal solutions, specify preferences, check feasibility of preferences, determine the most preferred solution and so on. And for each of these, uh, these tasks, we analyzed how that task can be can be facilitated 
by these kind of lower level tasks from visualization literature. So for example, in this compare parent optimal solutions, uh, it involves filtering, abstractions or elaborations, encoding, reconfiguring and connecting. So this kind of elementary uh, tasks. And the input for this, this task is a set of parent optimal solutions. And then the output is that you get more insight about trade-offs between the solutions. So if you want to know more, uh, paper is there. And we will have an example about this guided optimization phase as well. Um, in our recent research, we integrated visual analytics with the process of interactive multi-object optimization in a paper that, that this we submitted to IEEE transactions on visualization and computer graphics. And the components that we used were uh, our Destio framework, that I think I'm sure that Kaisa mentioned already, but it's an open source framework for interactive multi-object optimization developed at our faculty. And on the other hand, uh, we used Comvis, which is a coordinated multiple view system developed in the, in the visualization field. And uh, we used our previous task abstraction that we further augmented to, to do the visualization, visual design for this, this integration. You, you, you see a screenshot there, which, which may, might not tell you that much, but luckily we will have a short video demonstration next, narrated by Giovanni Misitano. And where we actually see, see this coordinated multiple views system in, in action. So let's hope that this works. I tested this yesterday with Giovanni and it was working then. So this, this is about, about five or six minutes long. So please let me know if you can't hear the voice when I start the video, or if you don't see the, see the video as such. Let's, let's hope that it works. Okay. In the showcase, we will feature the same multi-objective optimization problem, inner wear pollution, as featured in the original article. We have the five objectives shown, of which three first objectives are to be maximized, and the last two objectives are to be minimized. The variables of the problem are also shown. It is important to note, however, that our interactivized approach is applicable to other multi-object optimization problems as well. In our interactivized approach, we have a client running the Comvis software, which is connected to a server running software implemented using the Testio framework client and the server communicate over an internet connection. We begin our showcase with a simplified version of the dashboard. Please note that the initial solutions have been pre-computed, the nadir and the ideal vectors have been also determined beforehand. Please refer to the article for additional details. We begin by establishing a connection to the server. We can then move on to analyzing the initial solutions to the multi-object optimization problem. We can use the cursor to highlight one of the solutions in the parallel coordinate plot. When we do so, the same solution is also shown on the right in the scatter plot matrix. Next we will be selecting the first reference point by clicking on the first axis. We can fine-tune the size of the point, which is a good example of the many customization options Comvis has to offer. The size of the point is, however, 
purely visual. You can finish specifying more references by clicking on the remaining axis. Notice how the reference point is reflected on the scatter plot matrix on the right. Having the plot on the right updating according to the changes on the plot on the left is what we call linking of the views. We can also specify the reference point by inputting numerical values. Notice how the point on one of the axes changes according to the new numerical value given. We can now get new solutions by sending off reference values to the server, where new solutions are computed and sent back to Combis. Recall that the solutions returned by the server represent clusters. We can hide the initial solutions so that we have an easier time analyzing the new solutions which were computed based on our preferences. These new solutions are visible in both of the views. By once more providing new reference values, we can compute new solutions. We can then also choose to hide the solutions of the previous iteration to ease our task of analyzing the newest solutions. We may also choose to color the solutions in a single iteration based on some metric. For example, here we have colored them according to their distance to the ideal vector of the problem being solved. The darker the color is, the closer the solution is to the ideal vector. This can help us in analyzing the new solutions. Next, we will consider a more advanced dashboard to showcase additional features featured in our interactivized approach. Convis allows for very flexible customization of the dashboard. We can specify the number of containers and how many views each container should contain, arranged either horizontally or vertically. Each view offers a wide array of customization options to suit the needs of different decision makers. There are many different views to choose from. Each of the views can be resized by tracking on the container of the view. Next we will see how this kind of advanced dashboard could help us in analyzing different solutions. For example, we can paint on one of the axes in the parallel coordinates plot to select a range of values for an objective we are interested in. Notice how linking works here as well. We can see the selected range update in each of the views. Based on this range, a set of solutions is selected, which we can then analyze using the various views. We may also save some of the solutions that we think are interesting. We can select solutions to be saved from any of the iterations. Okay, <clears throat> I think I will stop it. Now it continues a bit, bit longer, but I guess this already made a good, or you could, could have an understanding of what is going on here. And what, what you should should uh, get out of this is that uh, when we are using the visualization tools developed by visualization professionals, you have lots of different options and, and, and uh, different kinds of co uh, easy connections between the views that is not, not maybe that easy to start doing by yourself. We will get back to this a bit later. Uh, I would also like to point out here that in addition to the visual aspects, it is good to also uh, augment that by showing the numerical values, as you can see here in the bottom of the solutions, so that uh, um, the kind of 
numerical values at least for those solutions that, that seem to be interesting are available. Then if, if you have a look at the top uh, right hand corner here, this, this view was, was generated for, for evaluating the progress of the preferences as mentioned. So now in this case, you see these three different reference points that the, that, uh, the decision maker provided so far. So each refer reference point is denoted by this, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, points on top of each other so that it that re reflect the values of the reference point. And now you can see that when how the uh, your preferences are evolving uh, with respect to time. So basically, when you start learning about the problem, how, how it reflects in your uh, preferences. And this is something that, that has not been available uh, in, in earlier implementations or tools. Then, um, as you can see, most of these visualizations are in the objective space, but we also have this visualization in, in the middle of the right hand side column for, for, for the decision variable space. And in this, this case, this is a simple uh, academic example, which you, uh, and, and, and it, it actually happens to have only two decision variables, so we could, could visualize them with uh, with uh, this two-dimensional scatter plot here. Unfortunately, there are no labels there, but, but that's not important here. But depending on what kind of application you are dealing with, um, the visualizations from the decision space can be very, very different. Imagine that you are uh, designing a bridge, for example. Then the visualization of the decision space would be different designs of a bridge. Or if you are doing some, uh, some road planning, then, then your uh, solutions would be different routes on a map. Or if you are, uh, what else? If you are designing some, some schedules, for example, for some events, and the visualization of the, the of the distance space would be the different schedules. So, uh, as you might might notice here, uh, the the visualization of the distance space highly depends on what kind of application you are dealing with. So, in in, in for that reason, uh, we don't pay that much attention of how you can visualize the the decision space but only highlight the importance of being able to visualize a decision space as well, and, and, and kind of linking that to the visualizations of the objective space. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. So I said, this is, um, this work is, is, is submitted, so we will, we will wait, wait for the decision, but, uh, but once it's accepted, I can, uh, I can share it with you if you are interested. Um, one, one challenge here is in this case is that although Destio is an open source framework, Convis is unfortunately not open source, so we cannot publish the, the kind of the tool as such. But this was just to demonstrate the, the kind of uh, potential of the integrated approach. Okay, let's move on. Third phase was the trade-off assessment, meaning that the candidate solutions obtained from guided optimization need to be further assessed. Um, what happens in this phase? depends a lot on, on the optimization approach chosen. For example, if you are doing or uh, using uh, this kind of interactive approach as we just uh, demonstrated, then the trade-off assessment phase is kind of uh, overlapping with the, 
with the optimization phase. But you can also do to this kind of a posteriori type of optimization where you generate a uh, set of, of solutions and then you are analyzing them afterwards. And that then, then this trade-off assessment is, is a separate phase as such. Um, also, the, the robustness, uncertainty, sensitivity, or other properties of the solutions are important in the, in the analysis phase. We'll get back to that a bit later. And surprise, surprise, coordinated multiple views are useful for this phase as well. As we, we have been seeing uh, we, when we discussed about the individual visualization techniques that uh, there is no superior technique for doing the visualization. So we need to use multiple, multiple views. There have also been some new visualization techniques developed for analyzing many objective solution sets recently. Uh, that kind of provide you more understanding about the properties of the solutions. And typically these have been, sorry, these have been done by extending existing approaches. And then some examples are listed below where for example, parallel coordinates, scatterplot matrix, or radial visualization have been extended. But uh, many of these approaches don't have a good implementations yet. So we're just, we just need to wait or, or imp implement them by ourselves if we want to use them in, in our tools. Then the final phase, the solution selection phase, is uh, kind of, well, you could say that it's the most important uh, phase, but it also depends on the other previous phases as we saw already. But the, but the uh, goal of this phase is to select the most preferred solution or solutions. And uh, well, uh, based on the, the previous phase, uh, you could could be narrowed down to a small set of a small set of solutions uh, among among you have to do the selection. And uh, well, coordinated multiple views again useful. But in case you have multiple decision makers, this this is kind of a very important phase as well uh, from different reasons than if you have only a single decision maker. Because if you have multiple decision makers, then uh, there is a need for negotiation because different uh, decision makers have different preferences or different uh, opinions of the problem, of the aspects of the problem. And in that case, uh, there is a need for finding a good compromise uh, among these. And some negotiation is needed and, and this, this process need to be facilitated as well. So, so, we, so in these cases, you need to have an analyst who, who knows the optimization tools and visualization tools and can facilitate this negotiation process. And, and if there are very big, uh, or there's a, a, a huge conflicts between the different decision makers, then you should be able to facilitate the finding a compromise solution where everybody is at least in some degree satisfied. And for this facilitation, the, the, the visualization aspects are also very important because you need to communicate the different aspects of the potential solutions to all the decision makers. And in this, this, this phase, the, the connection between the objective and the decision space is, is very important because you are selecting something uh, where you need to un fully understand the consequences of the, of the decisions. And um, well, this is 
something that we already mentioned. But then uh, the other kind of pros uh, properties of the solutions that you are selecting among is that um, if, if you have information or you should have information about uncertainty, robustness and sensitivity, and also the, how close the solutions are to the con constraint boundaries, these are important properties of the solutions in the solution selection phase. And this in information can be added to the views. Uh, well, if you have if you have the information available, for example, by using some coloring schemes, different type and size of the markers, or then using separate views. And some examples are listed here. How the, the robustness or uncertainty information can be added to the visualizations. And as said, the different phases can overlap or there might not be all of the phases in, in all the decision uh, problems. But the, the, the basic idea is that, that in any of the phases that you have, the visualization is an, an, an important tool for supporting your decision making. All right. So what, what kind of tools, what kind of visualization tools we have available for many objective decision making? We saw an example video of, of what we have been doing, but as I said, uh, we are not able to, 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 to put the tool available uh, openly to the, the license, license of Commons. So what, what there is actually available, um, most of you might be familiar with these existing visualization tools in, in the common programming environments. For example, for MATLAB users, there are different toolbox or apps for, for visualization that you can use. Or if you are, uh, if you are a Python user, I, I, I'm pretty sure that Matplotlib is, is familiar to you. Or then for our users, there are some packages for uh, for visualization. But this is something that when, when you are building your building your tools or software, then these are something that you can readily include from the from the tools that you are using. But they might not uh, have the all the properties that you you may want of those. For example, this interact, interaction uh, ability or linking, linking linked views or, or things like that. So, if you want to do, if you want to have some more advanced visualization tools, most of them are based on JavaScript. And, uh, for example, this D3 library might be familiar for at least some of you which is a library for manipulating documents based on data. So meaning that it's using HTML and CSS to kind of uh, visualize the, the data from your document. There are some examples of, of parallel coordinate plots that are based on the D3 library. And this, this uh, second one of these, this is, this is the one that I showed you from Cornell. So basically, you can do interactive uh, visualizations with this quite easily. But the thing is that, well, you need to need to uh, be able to to program those quite often because there are not not that much ready-made tools that you can just just uh, plug and play basically. Then I think many of you might have heard about Plotly. So DAS and Plotly is a library for creating machine learning and data science web app, app, apps. And uh, Plotly supports at least Python, R, and Julia. 
So uh, if you're using those languages, then then you can you can use uh, these tools for creating the apps for you. Then third example that I had here is React, which is a library for creating interactive uh, user interfaces. And uh, one example of, of, of a tool that uses this react.js components uh, is Victory, which, which, is, uh, which you can use for modular charting and data visualization. And uh, if you are interested to learn more about this, you can also visit the, the, the work of, of Mika Lautinen, who is doing a master's thesis for uh, in our faculty. And he has been making some interactive components for our SDL framework based on Victor. So, so to summarize here, you have some uh, inbuilt tools in your uh, programming environments, but then if uh, that, that do the, some basic basic visualization approaches. But if, if you want to do more customized visualization solutions, then uh, uh, one option is to use these JavaScript based tools. But it means that you you need to do some some more programming in there. There probably oh, exist some other tools as well for this, but I'm, I'm happy to happy to hear about those if you know some. But these are the, 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 the tools that I'm aware of. Then in our chapter, book chapter, that this presentation is based on, we also made this, this table, which tries to identify what kind of visualization approaches there exist for many objective optimization. The first three mentioned here are examples of, of uh, process integration and design optimization software that are commercial ones, but have very uh, versatile visualization tools as well. And their, um, their benefits include that uh, they have easy, easy, they can be easily integrated with, with the existing simulation, simulation tools and software that, that are widely used nowadays. Then, um, well, one, sorry, one comment at the moment. So in the first column, you, uh, the, the, the reference to the paper, it's, it doesn't make that much or give that much information for you because it's just uh, the citations are from the chapter. But if you are interested in some of those, please send me an email and I, I, can, I can send you the paper or, or direct you to the paper. But then the second, second category uh, is the are the papers where, where they mention implementation. And uh, you, see that, you see that there are some of, some of uh, well, some of the approaches have implementation also, and you have some open source stuff there as well. And then for some, some of those, there are not, inform no information about the licenses. So it's... Then the last category are the, the papers for example, like the Woodruff, uh, Woodruff and, and others paper about this general aviation aircraft, where they have utilized uh, visualization, but there is no implementation given. Okay, but well, this is just to show you that there are ex some tools exist that kind of either combine visualization or, or many, object, many object optimization, or then are just visualization stuff uh, developed for many object optimization. For example, like this parasol uh, implementation, 
it is it doesn't include any optimization tools but it's a visualization tool developed for analyzing many objective optimization solutions uh, further observations are that you can see that linking is not available for some of these some of these uh, software or approaches and then on the second column uh, uh, indicates the views that are used and you can see that uh, there are some that only have a single view or then they have more those that have for example only two views but there are not that many many uh, solutions that have multiple views where you can kind of customize and select the views that you want to want to use. Okay, so we are start to wrapping up the presentation and uh, we do that by identifying some future research directions that we came up with when we were writing this book chapter. First of all, we noticed that uh, there is a need for for accessible, flexible, and interactive visualization toolkits to accompany many objective optimization software. Quite often the case is that uh, the developers of many objective optimization software, they have not paid much attention of the uh, user interface or visualization aspects of their software. Um, and then especially there is a lack for approaches that are open source and do not require coding knowledge to use. So kind of plug and play things. And, uh, and there's also, as we see it, there's a need for collaboration with visualizers and experts in user interface design when, when you uh, develop your software. Because as you, as you saw from the video that we, we saw, uh, by, by combining the expertise of uh, optimization experts and visualization experts, we could come up with solutions where, where both of these aspects are, are well developed. Secondly, uh, there exist some visualization toolkits as, as we saw from the previous table. But uh, many of them lack flexibility. So meaning that uh, you would have uh, coordinated multiple views or you could manipulate and process views interactively in real time. So many of those support only limited number of views or, or that they are not interactive. So they, so they only utilize static views. And the third thing that we want to point out is that there is a need for continued methodological innovation in visualization for many objective decision making. And one thing is that uh, there's a need for visualization tools also for problem formulation phase. We saw an example, for example, we saw an example of this value three, which is kind of very basic kind of visualization tool. So, so more advanced visualization tools supporting the problem formulation phase. For example, including also, also this causal, causality information and, and uncertainty information and, and all these kind of aspects are needed. Then, uh, as, you already, uh, as you all know, nowadays, many people are operating these uh, mobile devices and using the, the uh, applications in those. So the visualization techniques for touch-based interactions uh, would be needed as well. If you want to provide solutions for uh, any objective decision support through mobile devices. So far, I guess most, most of the, the, most of the solutions that, that uh, I have seen are for uh, support uh, supported for use usage by computer and when you when you have to do the the 
uh, interactions in a, in a smaller screen and based on the touch, it's the situation is different. And also there's a potential to utilize the, the virtual or augmented reality solutions in, in uh, uh, analyzing the, the high dimensional solutions that's here or other, other aspects of, of decision support. Thank you everybody for your attention. I want to acknowledge my contributions, my, my contributors in this visualization research. So Kaisa Giovanni and Pupinder from, from our group. Then Kresimir and Sanjin from the VRV VR Research Center in Austria that we are collaborating with, uh, with this uh, Comvis, uh, Comvis software. And then Patrick and David from Cornell University that were co-authors in this book chapter. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions or comments. <laughs>